Hi, it's Eric here from NHS Global. Today I'd like to talk about vitamin K, more specifically vitamin K2. I bet if you ask the average person what vitamin K is, most would reply, I didn't even know there was a vitamin K. Or if they remember anything from their 7th grade health science class, they might reply, isn't that for blood clotting? Well, actually, it's vitamin K1, not K2, that's involved in blood clotting. Clearly, most people don't know the difference between vitamins K1 and K2. So it's not surprising that so few know of, much less appreciate, how vital vitamin K2 is in supporting good health. Biochemistry is a somewhat complex subject, so I'm going to present a very simplified explanation of how vitamin K2 functions and why it's so important in supporting optimal health. At the same time, I'll try to clarify some points of confusion about this vital nutrient. The topics I'll be discussing include, what is vitamin K and why is there so much confusion about it? Why is vitamin K2 so vital to health? What's the difference between the MK4 and MK7 forms of vitamin K2? What's the difference between the trans and cis forms? What are the dietary sources of vitamin K2? Why is it so important to take a vitamin K2 supplement, yet not so important to take a vitamin K1 supplement? And finally, why we believe VK2, our vitamin K2 product, is superior to most other vitamin K2 supplements. So let's begin. What's so confusing about vitamin K? Well, first of all, people often confuse vitamin K with potassium. K is the chemical symbol for potassium on the periodic table of elements, but potassium is most definitely not vitamin K. Secondly, there's no such thing as vitamin K per se. Rather, vitamin K actually refers to a family of fat-soluble vitamins called quinones. Each quinone has a similar but different structure from the other quinones in the family. Vitamin K1 is known as philoquinone, while vitamin K2 is known as menaquinone. Vitamin K1 and K2 are said to be vitamers of vitamin K, meaning that each of these quinones functions as a separate vitamin. So what are these functions? Well, in order to understand how these vitamin K vitamers function, it's important to first understand what vitamin D does. Many people know that vitamin D is involved in calcium absorption. It's widely understood that when the active form of vitamin D binds to vitamin D receptors in the small intestine, it facilitates calcium absorption, actually increasing calcium absorption by a factor of 10. This is obviously very important in supporting optimal health. However, the role vitamin D plays in calcium utilization is much lesser known and is of equal if not greater importance. You see, vitamin D stimulates the body's synthesis of some specialized proteins which are characterized by their glutamic acid residues. These proteins, known as GLA proteins, have the unique ability to bind to calcium, but only when they have been activated by vitamin K. In biochemical terms, this activation process is known as gamma glutamyl carboxylation. Because these GLA proteins depend on vitamin K for their activation, they are known as vitamin K-dependent proteins. Okay, so now that we've discussed vitamin K-dependent proteins, let's get back to explaining how vitamins K1 and K2 function. Both vitamin K1 and K2 are cofactors in the activation of vitamin K-dependent proteins. Vitamin K1 activates vitamin K-dependent proteins in the liver which enable them to do their part in the blood coagulation process. Vitamin K2 activates vitamin K-dependent proteins in the bloodstream, which enable them to do their part in shuttling calcium ions around in the body. The calcium ions are shuttled from where they should not be, like in the heart valves, arterial linings, and kidneys, to where they should be, the teeth and bones. More specifically, Matrix GLA protein, also known as MGP, is a vitamin K-dependent protein secreted by arterial linings, and when activated by vitamin K2, it supports inhibition of calcification in the heart valves and arterial walls. It also supports the inhibition of kidney stone formation in the kidneys. Considering what a big role calcification of arterial walls and heart valves plays in developing heart disease, 
the implications of these vitamin K2 induced actions in supporting cardiovascular health cannot be understated. Osteocalcin, also known as OC or BGLAP, is another vitamin K dependent protein. But unlike MGP, OC is secreted by osteocytes in the bones. And when activated by vitamin K2, it shuttles calcium to the bone matrix in order to increase bone density. Considering what a big role calcification of bone plays in maintaining bone health, the implications of these vitamin K2 induced actions in supporting bone health cannot be understated. Another point of confusion regarding vitamin K2 is the question of which form is better. To address this point, let me first explain what the different forms are. Vitamin K2 consists of a group of chemically similar subtypes, also known as homologs. Each homolog is differentiated by the length of its side chains. Each side chain contains functional groups known as isoprene units. The nomenclature for naming menequin homologs is based on the number of isoprene units they contain. The name for each menequinone begins with the letters MK followed by a number. The M stands for menequinone, the K stands for vitamin K, and the number refers to the number of isoprene units contained in the side chain. Vitamin K2 homologs range from MK4 to MK14. However, MK4 and MK7 are the only menaquinones used in dietary supplements. So which menaquinone homolog is better? Well, it's not an easy question to answer. The research is not conclusive because there really has not been a lot of research comparing MK4 to MK7. MK4 and MK7 each have their own unique qualities. For example, MK4 is the only form of vitamin K2 present in the brain where it is believed to manage inflammation and oxidative stress, and in doing so, it maintains the structure of brain cell membranes. MK4 is also thought to be better at blocking calcium in the arteries, heart valves, and kidneys. MK7, on the other hand, is thought to be better at building bone density. Many marketers of MK7 products claim that MK7 is superior to MK4. Their main talking point is that MK4 has a much shorter plasma half-life than does MK7. The implication being that more frequent doses of MK4 must be taken as compensation. I consider this to be a bit of a fallacy. Although it's true that MK7 can be detected in the blood for a longer time than MK4 can, that's no reason to disparage MK4. On the contrary, it's not as if MK4 just breaks down and is gone forever. Rather, it dissipates from the blood rapidly because it's soaked up so quickly and readily by the many organs and tissues that need it, much faster and in greater amounts than MK7. Keep in mind that even though the amount of MK4 stored in the arteries, glands, and organs can't be directly measured, it's there performing specific biological activities and could even last longer in the body than MK7 does. The bottom line is that vitamin K2 research is still in its infancy, and we just don't know what we don't know. But all things considered, one could reasonably argue that if anything, MK4 is more important than MK7 and not the other way around. However, I personally feel there's really no reason to be in one camp to the exclusion of the other. Rather, I consider it wise to be in both camps. Another concept worth mentioning is vitamin K2 isomers. An isomer is a molecule that has the same molecular formula as another molecule, but with a different chemical structure. In the case of vitamin K2, both MK4 and MK7 can exist in two isomer forms, the trans form, which is bioactive, and the cis form, which is not bioactive. The transform is shaped like a straight line, while the cis form is configured as an L shape. If you think of the transform like a master skeleton key that fits all locks, you can understand how it unlocks, or activates, all vitamin K dependent proteins it encounters. On the other hand, it's easy to visualize how an L shaped cis form cannot fit all the way into a lock and can't activate any vitamin K dependent proteins it encounters. 
That's why if you're going to take a vitamin K2 supplement, regardless of whether it's MK4 or MK7, it's so important to find one that contains the highest percent possible of transform isomers. Otherwise, you'll likely receive much less bioactive vitamin K2 than you think you're getting and need. The problem is that most vitamin K2 product manufacturers don't even disclose how much trans and cis forms are present in their products. Dietary sources for vitamin K1 include green leafy vegetables and vegetable oils. Vitamin K1 is also found in most fast foods. Furthermore, our bodies have the ability to recycle vitamin K1. So vitamin K1 deficiency is rarely, if ever, seen in adults. Even if someone was vitamin K1 deficient, consuming just very small amounts of green leafy vegetables, vegetable oils, or even some junk food would provide ample vitamin K1 to replenish the deficiency. Now when we speak of dietary sources of vitamin K2, we need to distinguish between MK4 and MK7. Dietary sources of MK4 include grass-fed animal products. Goose liver and dark meat from chicken or goose are the best food sources. Egg yolks, particularly from duck eggs, are also a decent source. MK4 is actually synthesized for commercial production. MK7 can only be produced by fermentation. Natto, a Japanese fermented soybean product, is the food source with the highest level of MK7, between 350 and 400 micrograms per ounce. Most Westerners do not particularly like the way natto tastes. Aged cheeses such as Gouda or Brie contain about 75 micrograms per ounce. Many people are vitamin K2 deficient particularly vegetarians and vegans. But vitamin K1 deficiency is exceptionally rare, which is why in most cases, there's really no need to supplement with vitamin K1. But it's very important to supplement with vitamin K2. And I believe both MK4 and MK7. The ideal dosage of vitamin K2 could be defined as the amount of MK4 and or MK7 needed to activate all the vitamin K2 dependent proteins in the body without exceeding the maximum safety amount. Research has not determined that exact value. Naturally, it would depend on whether we're talking about MK4 or MK7. It would also depend on the quality of the supplement, how much bioactive ingredients the supplement contains. And it would also depend on each individual specific condition, such as what medications they may be taking and their overall state of health. NHS Global is proud to introduce VK2, our vitamin K2 supplement. Unlike most other vitamin K2 manufacturers who choose to be in either the MK4 camp or the MK7 camp, VK2 contains both MK4 and MK7. It's also worth mentioning that unlike most other vitamin K2 supplements, VK2 is pharmaceutical grade. Being pharmaceutical grade, which is characterized by its yellow color, VK2 has a very high percent of transform isomers. If the vitamin K2 supplement you take is not yellow, then it's more than likely not pharmaceutical grade, and its ingredients are probably sourced from China, even if it's made in the USA. VK2 contains 5 milligrams of MK4, which is 100% transform, and 100 micrograms of MK7, which is 70% transform. VK2 was formulated to be the perfect one-to-one -one complement to DMAX, that's NHS Global's 5000 IU vitamin D3 product. The suggested usage is one capsule of VK2 for each capsule of DMAX, or any other 5000 IU vitamin D product. They should be taken at the same time. Well, that concludes our presentation. Thanks for taking the time to watch. For additional information, please visit v-k2.com or call toll-free 877-965-2140.